Um, so we, we, we go forward with the viruses. So first of all, viruses are very, 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 very small. They're incredibly small. Okay, typically too small to be seen with a light microscope. There are some exceptions to this. If you have a really, really high speed, low drag uh, light microscope, you can sometimes see pox viruses, which are fairly large viruses. But in general, they are too small to be seen with a microscope. Well, a light microscope. With an electron microscope, sure, no problem. No, no, they're not motile. In fact, they're, they're not alive. Well, debate on that point, but we'll talk about that too. All right, there's a little bit of debate. Are they alive or a form of life or not? Uh, in biology, we, we, the, the central, well, the accepted idea is that they're not alive. So they're not moving. All right. So far, so good. So viruses are not cells. Right? Think about life, and, and this is we're going to get to some points about them here later on, but they're not cells. We're going to talk about fungus later on. We're going to, we've talked about bacteria until we're blue in the, the face. We're talking about bacteria. Okay, we'll talk about some protozoans. We'll talk about some other pathogens. All of those are going to be cellular. They're going to be what we consider, quote-unquote, alive. But viruses, we do not believe, are alive. All right, viruses replicate and multiply only when they're in their living host. So someone asked the question, are they moving? And, and the answer to that is no, they're not moving. They're not doing locomotion on their own. Let me, let me kind of reiterate, the, come back to what you said. Are they, can they move in the environment? Yes, but not their own locomotion. They don't have a flagella motion moving. But they can, they can move. When they release through lysis, they, they'll, they'll go to another cell, but they're not doing their own locomotion. Right? There's no virus. The one I want to try to get to. There's no virus with a flagella or a cilia or something moving it. But they can. They can move between cells. But that motion is not from their own energy generation. All right. We call them obligate intercellular parasites. All right, so if you're obligated to do something, what does that mean? You're required, right? Were you obligated to come here in the snow? No, okay. But are you obligated to come during a test day? Yeah, so, okay. Obligate means you're required to do something. Intercellular. Inter is what? Inside, right? So they're going to be inside. And what's a parasite or parasitic relationship? One gets a benefit, the other one is somehow hurt. It's like that roommate who never pays rent and takes your beer. That's a parasite, right? Okay, that's kind of like a virus. They're going to take, but they're not going to give. Well, you, yeah, maybe. You could use that. Of course, of course, you know, as uh, roles change, then you become old, and then the child takes care of you, so. All right. So we're good with that. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by this whole intracellular obligate parasite deal? What we mean is we've got a cell. This can be a human cell. This can be a bacterial cell, whatever. All right? That virus has to enter in to that cell in order to replicate. Without going inside of a cell, it can't replicate. Okay? A bacterium can replicate without going inside of a cell. Now, some bacteria replicate inside cells. We talked about Listeria monocytogenes. That does have to go into a cell. But here, a virus can only replicate inside of a cell. That's the only place it's going to replicate. Other than that, it's just a piece of nucleic acid with some protein and sometimes an envelope around it. All right? All right, so viruses are going to use their own nucleic acids to replicate inside of the host cell. Okay, and, and let's, let's also, we'll get to this in a minute, but I want to make sure we got this point. What nucleic acids do we humans store our genetic information in? DNA. 
How about bacteria? What do they store their genetic information in? DNA. Specifically double-stranded. I'm going to use DS. I don't mean a Nintendo game system. I mean double-stranded. We all use double-stranded DNA. Bacteria use it for genetic storage information. We use it. Fungus use double-stranded DNA. Viruses, I'm going to say nucleic acids because some viruses are going to be RNA-based. Some viruses are going to be DNA-based. It depends on the virus. So basically, virus is kind of like turning into DNA for them. Well, okay, so, uh, and I'm going, to re I'm going to repeat your question because the microphone's facing this way, so that's why I'm repeating your question so the people, the people at home can hear. Um, so the question was, um, is, is a virus just like a piece of nucleic acid floating around? Yes, along with some associated proteins. So that's basically what it is. It's a piece of nucleic acid with some proteins around it, and then sometimes there's an envelope of a bilayer membrane around it. But that's basically all it is. So it's not protected by uh, It's protected by its envelope, it's protected by its uh, capsule around it. No. No. Exactly. If they're not exactly, if they're not living, then it's it's no big point. It's it's stuff can come in and out. It's it's a kind of an academic point. All right. And then we'll also talk about something called the vibro a vibroid, and that's a piece of double stranded naked RNA. That's another topic entirely. All right. Viruses cannot metabolize alone. They're obligated to be inside of a cell. All right. How viruses work is they're going to basically take over the machinery of a cell. And what was this is on the last test. What some of that machinery a cell has. What do I mean by machinery? Here's, here's our cell. This is us. What type of, this is a human cell, right? What type of machinery do I refer to? Huh? Cytoskeleton. How about, how about what's making our protein? Ribosomes. All right. Polymerases. Basically, it's going to take our machinery over, and it's going to use it for its purposes. Because it's not bringing its own machinery it's going to use our machinery and take over. Classic, okay, they can excise, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, typically it depends on the virus. Not all viruses are going to, what you're just talking about is something called a lysogenic pathway. And not all viruses can do a lysogenic pathway. So, um, so we'll get to that in a minute. Well, about 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. But I know the question you're asking, can, it, can a virus get into our genetic material, our, our genome, our nucleus? No. It basically has to kill the cell. The virus can excise itself. But when it excises itself, it's typically to start a, another pathway. So once it's in, it's in. <laughs> All right. So yeah, the only way is to get rid of the cell. We, we don't have a mechanism to get rid of that virus once it's integrated in. And why don't we? If it's replicated with the cell. Semi-conservative replication is going to just replicate with our DNA. So, all right. So let's talk about some components to a virus. Let's talk about components to a virus. Because there's, you know, there's lots of different components here. It's rather simple, but... You know, we're gonna we gotta talk about some of the parts. The first part we're gonna talk about is the center part right here, the nucleic acid. And again, I'm not gonna say DNA and or RNA. I'm gonna say nucleic acid a lot because this can be either DNA or it can be RNA. Depends on the on the uh, on the virus. We're gonna look at do all both types. This. Um, on this uh, unit. Now there are consequences for this and we'll get to that later on, but for right now we're just going to say there's two types, DNA or RNA. 
There are consequences to this, though. All right. So far, so good. All right. So surrounding this bad boy is a capsid. This thing right here. This whole shell in the center. See what I'm drawing with the purple in the, around there? That entire thing is the capsid. All right. Now, if a virus just has a capsid on its outside, it's a naked virus. Naked viruses do not have this envelope structure. They just have this capsid structure surrounding them. All right. If they have an envelope, they are an envelope virus. And they have a capsid as well, it's correct. So an envelope virus will have a capsid surrounded by an envelope. Whereas a naked virus will only have the capsid structure here. Naked, as in lack of clothing. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only write with my finger on here. It's not the, it's not the best pen. All right. Capsomeres are the individual sub protein subunits. So each of these little spheres here are capsomeres. All right. Each of those little proteins is a capsomere. Good to go? Okay. Nucleocapsid is the entire structure. So this whole structure right here, the whole structure, the capsid and the nucleic acid in it is a nucleocapsid. All right. All right, so far so good. Basic, just in functional anatomy of these guys. Next is the envelope. So this bilayer membrane. And would you care to guess where this bilayer membrane comes from? Well, let's think about how a virus works. A virus grows in our cells and uses our cells. So guess where this bilayer membrane comes from? From us. It's going to come off, and as it comes off, it's, what do we call it when a cell releases from another cell? Exocytosis. It's going to bleb off part of our membrane, and that membrane you see there is from its host cell. Exocytosis. Now, I'll ask you a question, and it's counterintuitive, but I'll still ask the question. Which one do you think is more hardy, a naked virus or an envelope virus? Naked. A naked virus is much more hardy. Well, this, the thing about the envelope, it's so, it's easy to disrupt. And if you disrupt the envelope, then you're going to disrupt the life pattern of the virus. And it, it's a very, it's an easy to disrupt structure. Uh, because it's, it's, it's used for infecting our cells later on. So there's an advantage to it if it's, if it's a shorter period of time. But if you're talking weeks or months, then a, a naked um, uh, virus is better. But it can use that envelope to do endocytosis and enter into cells. So it can use that envelope as part of its entry scheme. All right. Here we have naked viruses. They're going to form pits and come in that way. So naked viruses are going to enter a different way than envelope viruses. <laughs> Endocytosis insofar as an invagination will form and they will come in in, a, in essentially a, a vesicle. So 
Envelope viruses, envelope viruses do it by fusion. The membrane on the virus fuses with the membrane on the host cell. And as it fuses, then the viral genetic information enters. That would be an envelope virus. A naked virus, think about little viron particles here. It's going to come in through a vesicle as well. So is it endocytosis too? Yes. Is it a different type of endocytosis? Yes. One relies on a membrane fusion. The other one relies on an invagination with viral particles coming in. Envelope virus, naked virus. The envelope virus, you would, it, would, it has the receptors on that envelope. If you take them off, it can't do that. All right. Okay. All righty. All right, but point, point here is that envelope viruses are not as hardy as naked viruses. Because if you disrupt that outer layer, then you're, you're inhibiting its life pattern. All right, we continue. On the outside of the envelope, we have these spikes, these projections on the outside. All right, it has to do with how it interacts with its target cell. We're going to talk about how these enter, but there has to be some recognition of the virus particle to the host cell. All right. Okay. Glycoproteins, another projection. Again, these are, it will help it to adhere to target cells. All right. So far, so good? All right. And last, we have a viron. A viron, and a lot of virologists will call these things just virons straight up. A viron is a complete viral particle. So a lot of virologists will say, you know, how many virons are there? They're really, you know, they mean how many individual viruses are there, but a lot of times we'll call them virons. So the whole thing, the whole viral particle is a viron. All right, are we good with that? All right. So are viruses alive? This is an old chestnut in, in most microbiology and virology classes. Are they alive? All right. Right now in biology, we would say that they are not alive, but they do have some features of life. Okay, so some characteristics of life is growth, right? We grow. We start ultimately as, what, a sperm and an egg coming together, and they fuse, and, you know, we grow from that, right? Can viruses grow? Yeah, you get the flu. I'll show you how they grow. Okay, self-reproduction. We reproduce, right? We have the capacity to reproduce. Can viruses reproduce? Yeah, you betcha. Responsiveness. Can they respond to their environment? We talk about viruses in the lytic and lysogenic pathways later on. Yeah, they can respond. If a virus is in a cell, in the genome of a cell, it can excise itself and start a lysogenic, or excuse me, a lytic pathway. We'll talk about that when we talk, get to that area. But yeah, they can respond. If a cell is in trouble, they can pull themselves out of that cell and start making more viruses. All right? Able to metabolize. Well, they can't really metabolize on their own, but with a host cell machinery, they can. But here's the thing. They show all of these features when they are inside of a cell. A virus lacks all of these features when they're outside. When they're outside of the cell, all they are is just a nucleic acid wrapper, excuse me, a nucleic acid core with some type of wrapper around it. That's all they are. They're not moving on their own. They're not metabolizing on their own. Well, we're going to get to that. You can grow them in culture. You can grow them in eggs, for instance. But you can't put them on a TSA plate and grow them. 
Uh, have you ever gone to get a uh, immunization and they'll say, are you, are you allergic to chicken? Okay, that's because they're growing the viruses in chicken eggs. And it, it's an intracellular parasite. It will grow in that egg. All right, so to answer your question, you can grow them in cell culture. You can also grow them in these uh, culture dishes. They're like, they look like cat bottles, but they have, they're like flat, very flat, and you can grow them in those. But growing viruses in a lab is, is not an easy task, not compared to bacteria. All right, so one view is that it's just a complex pathogenic chemical particle. Basically just nucleic acid in a fancy wrapper. Another view is that viruses are the least complicated form of life. Currently what's accepted by biology in general is that one right there. But there are some that argue for this position right here. But I'm not going to come down either way on it. All right. But biology in general says they're not alive. Some people think that they are right on the threshold of life. So. Okay. Are we good to go on that? Virus is not alive. They have some qualities of life, but we just say that they are. We, we typically think that they are not alive. <coughs> All right. Onward and upward to viral replication. Okay, so viral replication. Viruses or a lot like viral videos. They start with a couple of views, and then all of a sudden you start putting them on YouTube, and you know, excuse me, on Facebook, and then you start you know, sending them to friends and all that, and then they get millions of hits, right? All right, so you know this guy, right? Is it a Russian singer? You ever seen, you ever seen that video? No, he's a Russian singer in the 70s. He, he died a few months ago, but he became a hit. Uh, these kids, I think, have a couple hundred million hits. She was upset about someone being upset with Britney Spears, I believe. Point is, viruses are like this. We're going to start with a few, and we're quickly going to progress to many. All right? Okay, so let's, let's get on the material here. We're going to go through each one of these steps. First is recognition. The virus particle has to recognize with the target cell. Now, going back to the idea of having an envelope, and it has those features on the outside of the envelope, if you can somehow disrupt that envelope, what do you think you're going to do to that recognition step? You're going to, you're going to inhibit that recognition step. That's why we think of an envelope virus they're, they're not as hardy as a naked virus. So it's not just like if you destroy the envelope, it became a naked virus. Correct. Correct. A naked virus, but it doesn't have the features on that yeah. to infect other cells. So you're, you're disrupting it that way. Next is absorption. We're going to bring it in. We're going to talk about each one of these points. I'm going to talk about them in, in general. Next is absorption. We're going to bring the virus inside. And that will be penetration. So absorption and penetration, you know, it's, it's basically happens at the same time. After it's absorbed, it then penetrates and enters into the, the um, target cell. Uncoating. Synthesis here. Synthesis will be of its nucleic acids and its viral components. And then finally we have release. The virus will progress outward. All right. So the first part is recognition. Recognition. It will recognize the host cell. Typically, there's a lot of specificity with this. And what do I mean by specificity? It's typically specific, right? Like, for example, are you going to catch, a, if, if a pig has a, a version of the flu, is it, is it likely you're going to catch that flu? No. Now, now it can. We'll talk about antigenic shift and drift later on. But typically, you're not going to catch... So a, a flu virus from a, from a pig, 
for instance. Ch or chicken, but you know, that we'll, we'll get to that with the shift and the drift principles, but it's not really common. All right. So that's recognition. Now, we'll, when we talk about rhinoviruses, we'll talk about the canyon hypothesis. Okay, well, again, point is the virus has to somehow recognize something on the host cell. It has to somehow connect to that host cell. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. HIV, another uh, one here. We'll talk about T cells later on with HIV. We'll help talk about helper T cells and CD4, things like that. But again, the virus has to recognize some type of a feature on the host cell. All right. We'll talk more about this when we talk about specific viruses, though. But for the here and now, the virus has to connect to a host cell. That's the first step. All right. Very quickly, this is, and then goes to the absorption stage. So it's connected to the host cell. All right. Absorption. No, absorption. That's correct. Absorption. Yes, right. All right. So far, so good. I can. Oh, is that not one one? I'm sorry. One. There we go. Okay. All right. Next is penetration. Penetration is a viral particle will begin to enter inside of our host cell. Now, talking about an envelope virus, what happens here? The envelope fuses with the host membrane, right? But what's inside that envelope? A nucleo capsid, right? So here, look, it's, it's up here, but let me just draw it up here. All right, so we've done this attachment. It's now coming inside. We have our nucleocapsid inside, right? It has the genetic information in it. What do you got to do next, do you think? Replicate. Well, not replicate. If my genetic information is in a protein shell, what do you think I got to do? I got to get it out of there. I got to uncode it. I've got to somehow remove that capsid, allow that nucleic acid to come out to do its job. All right. Another way viruses enter is this idea of this in mass penetration. So multiple viruses or virons will come inside at one time. Naked part, correct. So here it's not one membrane fusing with it and doing some type of an endocytosis. Here, we have uh, invagination, and there's multiple viral particles here, and they will come in. Again, they're coming in through an endocytotic event. Can you say naked, means? naked means it doesn't have an envelope around it. So there's two types. There's ones that have an envelope, 
which is a bilayer membrane around it with a virus in the middle, and others have just a nucleocapsid without a membrane around it. All right, we're good? Okay. All right, uncoding. We talked about that a second ago. Once it is in, it has to do what? It'll release it. What? DNA or RNA, right? Because if it's inside of a protein shell, that nucleic acid has to somehow leave that shell. So that would be the next step, the uncoding step. Kind of makes sense, though, when you think about it. All right. Next is synthesis. Okay. No, the envelope, no. It does happen, but when an envelope virus comes in, where does the envelope stay? On the outside. Fluid mosaic model is if, if it's an envelope virus, right, the envelope will stay on the outside. It will fuse with the host cell membrane. So then it just comes out. All right. All right, then is synthesis. Synthesis, the virus will start taking over the host machinery, if you will. It's going to start making what, do you think? Well, let's think about a virus. Let's go back to the idea, what is a virus? DNA or RNA, and we're going to talk about specific types of viruses here in a second. But we know we have... Okay, picture for one. We know we have some type of nucleic acid in it, right? Either DNA or RNA. That's one thing it's going to make. Capsomeres, the protein shell, is going to start forming those capsomere proteins. The spikes, it's actually going to make the spikes, but what it's going to do is it's going to put those spikes on the outside membrane of its host cell, and as the virus comes out, then that piece that comes out will have those features on it. All right, so it's going to make the individual components for the virus. All right, so we've made them. Next is maturation. Maturation will be... Combining them together. We've made all these components. We're going to start connecting them together. All right. And what do you think the last one is here? Release. I can. Hang on. Combine them together. All right, we're good? All right. End of it, then we do what? We've made our viruses, then we release the virus, release the hounds. They can counter what we counter, too. They can, our immune system, so come back to your question here. Um, can, and we'll answer both of these. Can our immune system detect them? Yes. I mean, there are things like neuroamidases, hemoglutin. Our immune system can detect features on the outside of a virus. But a virus can change over time, and when those changes happen, it makes it our, our immune system less able to respond to it. So the virus can change over time, mutation, and then our immune system is not as equipped to handle it. So that's one we'll get into when we start talking about like flu virus, of why it 
why we have to get an immunization every year. Because they can change their outer features. They can actually mix and match those features and um, become almost a new virus to our immune system. So, all right. We're good on that. All right. Okay, culturing viruses. How do we make viruses? Okay. Is there any new topic here? We've been talking about viruses, right? And the problem is what? We have to have a host cell to grow in, right? Well, you can't, you know, think about what you've done with bacteria in the lab. You, you've grown it on a plate, but you haven't really worried about doing host cells and things like that because bacteria, well, a lot of bacteria do not need a host cell. Some bacteria do, but a lot of them, a lot of them don't. So we can grow them in culture, you know, in, in the laboratory. But in viruses, you have to have some type of a host cell that can grow the virus. All right, we're going to talk about two methods here. We're going to using culturing eggs. You actually can grow them in other cell culture methods we'll talk about here in a second. All right. We're good to go? Not yet? All right. Right. Good? All right, so the first method here is culturing them in eggs. I'm going to jump forward for one, and I'm going to come back to this. Don't worry. This is what I mean by large scale. Okay, there's actually devices that will move these eggs in labs. So they, they will, act, if you can see it in this picture right here, they will move thousands and tens of thousands of eggs at one time. All right, so you don't just make a, you know, a vaccine just, this, is, this goes back to vaccination later on, but, you know, if you need to grow up a lot of virus to do something with it, you know, you just can't just grow it up in a, in a lab very easily. You have to actually go through these, these steps. All right. So the first method is using chicken eggs. There's a couple advantages. It's inexpensive. You know, chicken eggs are not that much. Large scale they're internally sterile. Basically, they just inject the, vi the egg with virus. The virus, being an intracellular parasite, gets into the egg, cells in the egg. They replicate more viruses. And then you just destroy the egg and then pull the viruses out through filtration. There, well, it depends on the virus. Some viruses are going to need multiple, and we'll talk about specific viruses, some need just a few viral particles to set up an infection, and some need many. So it just depends on the virus. And I know that's maybe not a, a fulfilling answer, but we'll talk about some viruses don't need many and some need more. It just depends on the virus. Ways to classify viruses. Good times. Ways to classify viruses. All right. So we talk about nucleic acids. What kind of nucleic acids? And we're going to talk about those in detail. Are they double-stranded DNA or are they single-stranded DNA? Are they double-stranded RNA or are they single-stranded RNA? We'll also talk about sense here as well. The host. Is it an animal host? Is it a bacterial host? We have a bacteriophage, so it can be a bacterium being the host. Is it a plant host? We're not going to really worry too much about plant host in here. You know, it's more health microbiology. So we'll talk more about animal host, us. But we will talk a little bit about bacteriophages because there are some medical, medical relevance to them. We talked about... Um, what did we talk about last time where that was important? Streptococcus, what? Pyogenes? Remember we said that it had to have, we called that lytic convert or lysogenic conversion? 
or that bacterium had to have a phage that would, quote unquote, turn it on, make it more pathogenic. We'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, bacteriophages can be important. You might not think about it, but they, they can be. The size of the bacterium, is it a large virus like a, a pox virus? Is it a small virus like a picovirus, picoviridae? We'll talk about that. The shape, is it a bullet-shaped one like rabies? Okay, the shape uh, is one. And then outer coating, we've talked about that. We've talked about naked and we've talked about envelope viruses. We'll talk about each of those. All right. So, and this is, you know, remember we started talking about DNA last time and everything, and I said it was setting us up for some more stuff? And this is part of the setup. All right. So, viruses. We can have our double-stranded, let me write some of these out. We'll talk about each one of these in detail. And we start looking at the life cycle of a virus, then it will become important. We can have single-stranded DNA. We can have double-stranded DNA. We can have single-stranded RNA. We can have double-stranded RNA. And with the single-stranded and double-stranded DNA and RNA, we can actually have what we call positive sense or negative sense. And we'll talk about what that sense means here in the next slide. But in all of these, they're going to positive sense mRNA. All of the different viruses we're going to talk about, they all have one goal, and that one goal is to make positive sense mRNA. Okay? So far, so good. Okay. So what is positive sense? What is negative sense? Positive sense is the RNA strand that is read by a ribosome. Okay? Negative sense is the opposing strand, the complementary strand that is anti-parallel. Okay, so in this little diagram, what I'm trying to show you, if this is the positive sense, this strand right here is positive sense, then what will happen? Positive sense does what? what will, if, if positive sense is used to make protein, what will interact with a positive sense strand? Ribosomes, that is correct. That process is called translation, correct. So we want our positive strand of mRNA because that positive strand will be read by ribosomes from the host cell, and as it moves down that mRNA, it will make what? Protein, exactly. So no matter what virus type we're talking about, be it a retrovirus, being it a double-stranded DNA, a double-stranded RNA, a single-stranded RNA, a single-stranded DNA, no matter what virus we're talking about, it's all going to positive sense. Because that is what makes protein. Exactly. Okay, in this diagram up here, what I've tried to show, do you see this picture right here? What's, this, what's going on here? What's going on in that picture to the right? Translation, correct. If you look at the strand right here, where, see where it says A, G, U, C, G, U, A, A, see that? What I'm trying to show you is this strand right here, right there, is that strand right there. It's a positive sense mRNA. It can be directly read by the ribosome to make protein. 
be it capsiromere, the, caps, the protein for the capsid, whatever protein you're talking about, that mRNA is read by the ribosome. The complement, what do I mean by complement? What do I mean by that? It's partner. The, if it's A, it would be U. Well, and we're talking RNA. But you remember A, T, G, and C, and DNA, and A, U, G, and C, and RNA. That idea, that it is the opposite of it. Not only is it the opposite, if this, if this was had prime numbers, wouldn't it be anti-parallel? Remember we, with DNA, we said DNA is anti-parallel. It goes 5 prime to 3 prime, and then 5 prime to 3 prime. Remember that? Okay, these are complements. If this is the positive sense, this is the minus sense. All right. If you have a single stranded part in your DNA virus, correct. Does it only make positive sense? Or do some of them make it depends on the virus. Some will make more negative sense to active template to make many more positive sense. And we've got some examples of that. But at the end of the day, their end goal will be to make positive sense. Some are going to make negative sense because that's template to make positive sense. And we will have an example of that. So it depends on the virus. But we, we, we'll have actually specific examples of that coming up here in a few minutes. All right. But no matter what you do, we're all going to positive sense for what reason? To make protein. We want to make protein. We ultimately want to make protein. All right, there's a drive toward positive sense RNA. And all the viruses we're going to talk about. Somehow, in some fashion, they're trying to get there. All right. Good to go? Okay, so let's talk about one, a couple examples of this. We're not going to talk about every single example, but we're going to talk about some. But we're going to see that the whole point in all of the ones we talk about is what are we trying to go to? What's our end goal? Positive sense RNA. All right, so here we have what? It starts on the virus right here. Here's our virus. It comes into our cell. It releases what? Well, we're going to start this with single-stranded RNA. This is going to come back to one of your questions you, ha you had. So we're going to enter into our cell single-stranded RNA. We're going to stick in one piece of positive sense RNA. What's the problem here, guys? Well, let's, let's think of it this way. Let's think of it this way. If I'm making a lot of viral particles, do you think I need more than one piece of this? If my end goal is to make hundreds, thousands, millions of viruses, and I just put in one, what's the problem? I can't make any, so what am I going to do? I'm going to make, I'm going to use another color here, I'm going to make a negative sense RNA which is the complement to the positive sense. And then what can I do with my negative sense RNA? Make positive sense RNA as a copy. Right? So this can serve as template, right? And the negative sense RNA serves as template to make more positive sense RNA. This positive sense RNA makes more and more and more and more and more and more and then I can do what with this positive sense RNA? I can make protein and more virus, exactly. If this started off as positive sense, don't I need more positive sense to make my virons at the end? Yes, that makes it. Don't I need more of this to make protein? Yep, that makes it. So in this strategy, a positive sense RNA virus comes in it will make a negative sense RNA, which is anti-parallel and complementary, just like your DNA, two strands of DNA, 
And then that will serve as template for making more positive sense RNA. Goes to protein synthesis, it goes to making more virons. All right? We're good on that. So again, here is our positive sense here. It makes a negative sense here, and that positive negative sense acts as template for making more copies of my positive sense. I can then use that and this as well to make proteins to assemble my virus. What's that? So it's only making one negative sense on that. It's going to make more than one. Yeah, it can make more than one. So in the diagram, it just shows one, but it's, it's more than one. No, it can use this no, a minus sense RNA multiple times. It doesn't have to do it just one time. So it's going to make more just to make more. Well, there's an amplification quality here. One can make many. I see where we're going with this. One can make many of these. And then all of these can make many of these. Right? So one of these can make three of these. They're throwing a number out. I'm not saying it's three, just a number out. One can make three of these. Each one of these can make three of these, so then I got nine of these from one of those. So there's an amplification quality as well. All right. Good to go? All right, so this is one strategy. We're going to look at another strategy here. But before I go, what was the goal? What was the ending product here? Positive sense RNA. That was the end goal. Positive sense in this situation because it needs the protein from positive sense and it needed positive sense for what else? To make more virons because it's a positive sense RNA virus. All right. Negative sense RNA virus. So we're going to start up here with a negative sense RNA. All right. Now, what's the problem here? What's wrong with negative sense? Can I do anything with it? It's just simple. I can't make protein. Hey, I need positive sense to make protein. I'm out of gas here. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make positive sense. So it's going to be kind of be the reverse idea here. I'm going to start with negative sense RNA. That negative sense will make positive sense RNA. And that positive sense RNA does what? It serves two functions. Makes protein and what else? Right? And more template for negative sense RNA, right? Because it's a template for the opposing strand. Well, no, the end, the end, well, the end goal was to make positive sense RNA insofar as that will make proteins. But then the virus also has to replicate its own genome to put in virons. So the, the driving thing will be to the positive sense because that's what's going to make the protein. Exactly. All these viruses, when we look at them, will have another step. Exactly. I mean, they have to come in. If it's a positive sense, then they have to make a negative sense to make more positive sense. If it's a negative sense, they have to make positive sense to replicate to make more negative sense. And to go to positive sense to make what? Protein. All right. Okay, we're good so far. Now you might, there's another question. I'm surprised someone's not asked this question. What's, the, what, 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 what's, the, what's doing that? Is that a question? Why, why did you do that? Okay, some viruses are also going to carry enzymes to do this process. So there will be, in some cases, enzymes in the viral particle that will be used here. So, all 
All right. Good to go. Not yet. And we've got double-stranded RNA after this. But I guess the whole point you, you should be seeing here is positive sense RNA is the end goal insofar as that will make the protein. No. <laughs> no. No. All right. Hmm? Yes, but in Ukraine, you only stop when the snow's this high. <laughs> All right, are we good to go? All right, double-stranded RNA. Let me get my little diagram here. Now we're going to start with both a positive and minus sense of RNA. And we separate those two. So now we have a positive sense and a minus sense. All right. So far, so good. Positive sense is going to make our protein, yes. Minus sense will serve as template to making more positive sense. Positive serve as template. Long story short, they're serving as template. Positive sense is making protein, and guess what we make at the end? Viruses because we've made what? Made protein, and then what else? We've made double-stranded RNA. We started with single, uh, I'm sorry, I'm right, double-stranded RNA. Yes, the product is double. This adds another step, actually. What do you mean, Texas? The positive sense will make, well, the diagrams of these are oversimplified. So, is the, correct. Vir virus RNA. So, the, the product of this will also be double stranded RNA. And that will be used in virons after that. Wild, isn't it? Riveting. Riveting. I, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> Hold on. All right. Are we good so far? All right. Example, rotavirus. I've told you about rotavirus before, right? You know, kills about... 400 to 600,000 people a year, mostly children. I always like to tell the numbers, like 60 to 70 people will die of rotavirus while this class has been going on. It's not fun. I, it, it, it's serious. I mean, it is a, it's, it's a terrible, and the sad, the sad thing is, it's treatable. It's, it's a very treatable virus. It's just, you know, huh? You had rotavirus? I bet you were around a toilet a lot. Did you have to go to the hospital with it or just could? Oh, no, actually, I got it on a vacation and had to fly back from Alaska with it. Oh. <laughs> All right. But we'll talk about the, the, the World Health Organization numbers fluctuate on rotavirus, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. All right. We're good to go, go so far. Okay. We'll talk about retroviruses when we start talking about HIV. It's a little bit more in-depth than what I'm going to talk about here, so I'm just going to skip this, and that will end the revised lecture. I've moved this to the um, HIV section. All right. All right. Now, that's the only ones you have to know, but I'll tell you, double-stranded DNA viruses, single positive-sense DNA, minus-sense DNA, same thing we just talked about up here. 
they're all going to what form of RNA? No matter if it's double-stranded DNA, positive sense RNA, because positive sense RNA can make the protein. All right. All right, I can. So you guys riveted by this? Yeah. It's, it's better than the Avengers and, and, and Fifty Shades of Grey and, and, and any other movie that's out. The Kingsman. I mean, it's all those. Question one. Mm-hmm. Why does they not convert? What do you mean not convert? Like, you know, you have to go through the series of injections to get you to be a gene for it? Yes. Well, after you have that series, that series... Why do some people not develop an immunity? Yes, thank you. Their immune system... Did, okay, so the, the principle of a vaccination is that you're basically uh, teaching your immune system the quote-unquote shape of that virus. So when it comes in, it can detect that shape. So, but the problem is this, you don't want to put a live virus into someone, right, that can take over and, and kill them. Different uh, ones, one are called attenuated, so it's a weakened form of the virus, some are anuclear. Answer your question. It could be that just their immune system did, was not able to recognize that weakened form or that anuclear uh, vaccination. Yeah, it does. Is that happening to you? Yes. Well, all right. All right, so we talked about viruses, different types of bacteria. We, talk, we had that list before. Now we're talking about virus and host. That was number two on that list. You have viruses that affect animal cells. You have viruses that affect plant cells. You have viruses that affect bacteria. The ones we're going to focus on mostly are going to be the animal viruses for, for good reason. Now, we will talk a little bit about bacteriophages or phages for short because the phages, you know, we'll talk about lysogenic conversion. Lysogenic conversion can make some bacteria more pathogenic. Hmm? Like scarlet fever would be one example. There's some other examples we'll talk about. Yes, ma'am. You mean in their genome? Yes. Oh, definitely. And we have viruses in our in, in our genome too. Yeah, we'll talk about. It's called lysogenic. It actually can integrate into the genome. And as a matter of fact, um, there is this idea. We, we'll talk. We'll hope to get to it in time. The Pertolonco gene theory, where we think that. Go to your thing. Um, viruses integrate into our cells, and that might even induce cancer. So, to answer your question, yes, viruses can keep them in there, and we can keep them in our cells too. No, no, you're, you're we're, okay. Can a can a bacterium hold on to a? I, okay, I, I think we're mixing something up here. Can a bacterium hold on to a bacterial phage type of virus in its genome? Yes. Can a bacterium have uh, an animal virus in it? Is that what was your question? I, if I see the question you're asking, no. No. But if, if you're asking can a virus, a bacterial-based virus reside in the genome of a bacterium, yes. All right. Okay, size, picoviridae, typically a small one, pox virus, typically large. Again, you can see some pox viruses with a light microscope if you have a really good light microscope. All right. We do. We actually do, yes. It is a scanning electron microscope, and uh, it's in uh, McGee Hall. No. 
No. Now, in, in regular microbiology, what we do, and, and I'm not kidding, we'll take sewage, and we'll, we'll try to get some enteric-based viruses that attack E. coli and do bacteriophage, things like that, but um, not, not in your lab. <laughs> um, probably not, because our, our, our electron microscope is a scanning EM, and it's not that good for seeing viruses. You need a transmission, not a scanning. Sorry. Sorry. Angry. I wanted to see a virus. Darn it. All right. If you're ever interested in how this, the electron microscope looks or anything, just ask me and I can go in there and show you. It's a, it's, it's a nice microscope. I think it was like 150,000 or 200,000, something like that. They're, 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 and then the service contract is, is substantial every year. So, yeah, it's, it's a piece of machinery. All right. We actually have a room just for it. All right. Okay, another way we do these is by shape. So this is number, th oh, excuse me, number four. We said there's different ways of classifying it. You can have a helical one. You can have bullet-shaped viruses. Bullet-shaped would be like rabies. And these isohedral ones. Point is, we have different ways of classifying viruses based on their shape. Right? And what I've tried to portray is, you know, you had talking about the nucleic acid part. That was important. But that was one way we classify viruses. Is it positive sense, minus sense? That's one way. Another way is by their shape. Right? They have different shapes. But all of this, don't, don't lose sight of the, the major point here, is you're trying to classify viruses. All right. No, 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 no. And when we start getting into the viruses, we're going to see that there's really no correlation between that and the shape. Okay. And the last one here was the outer coating. The outer covering of the virus. Is it a naked virus or is it an enveloped virus? Two different types of viruses. Enveloped, more hardy, excuse me, enveloped, less hardy, naked viruses, more hardy. They can survive a lot longer. When we start talking about like Norwalk virus, for instance, we'll see how that comes into play. All right. Good to go. Thumbs up. All right. No, no, okay. All righty. Okay. We're going to hold it there because the next part is viruses and cancer. And that's a little bit long, so we're going to just hold it there.